Good morning, everyone. This is Lee Andres with the Cotham and today I've got Debbie and Jeremy who are going to introduce themselves in just a moment. Thank you all for joining us this very early. Well, it's not that very early, but it's pretty early uh, for us on the East Coast and elsewhere in the world that we're not going to go there right now. So uh, we've got a pretty hot topic today and I want to get right into it. We're going to be talking about the decline of UX, what we mean by that. Um, but more importantly, how do we stop the bleeding? And there is some bleeding right now that's happening. Um, and hopefully some of my uh, prospective customers that I've had conversations with this week are listening in. Um, I'm pretty hardcore on the type of people that I represent in the UX and creative uh, domain because I always put myself as the end user that if you're designing a product and it's Lee easy, we are good to go. <laughs> if you miss a step to make that goal, then we are not, you're not going to get anybody I know <laughs> to work with you. So let's start by introducing Jeremy. Jeremy, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, hi, my name is Jeremy Kriegel. I've been a UX veteran for 25 years now, worked in a variety of companies, just about every industry from healthcare and biotech to B2B, B2C, gaming. I've been on internal teams, I've been a consultant for startups to Fortune 100s, big consultancies to independents. So I've been in a lot of different scenarios and I've been deeply involved in the Agile community for about the last 13 years as well. Nice. And Ms. Debbie, go ahead, introduce yourself. Hey, my story is quite similar there. Um, I'm Debbie Lovett. My company is called Delta CX. We're a full service CX and UX agency, and I've been doing this thing for about 25 years as well. And uh, I do focus on a lot of different areas, uh, certainly research and architecture and uh, interaction design. But uh, mostly people might have run into me on my Delta CX YouTube channel. I've also put out a couple of books. And mostly I am out there, which is also how I ran into Jeremy some years ago, uh, mostly out there speaking engineering and agile conferences to help uh, engineering teams better understand what UX is, not to do our jobs, but so that we can collaborate better and figure out this agile thing together and ultimately create better customer centricity. Awesome. What's interesting, though, about uh, both of your books is that you're not just talking about the engineering team. You're talking about throughout the enterprise. How does the UX piece really fit into all that we do in creating this product, you know, for our users and, and getting that buy-in and support, which I think is very unique uh, perspective. So thank you both for being with us today. I certainly appreciate your time. I know you've got a lot to do, so we'll get right on it. For those of you just joining, it looks like we've had some additional folks join to Level Set. We are here today with Debbie and Jeremy to talk about the decline of UX and what we can do, what that means, and what we can do to ensure its, um, its safety, if you will. So why don't we talk about what do we mean by the decline of UX? Jeremy, from your perspective, what does that mean to you? Sure. I think it's it comes as, as a surprise to most people because I think you'd find that there are more people doing the work now than at any point in history. So there's a lot of people out there with the title and are doing the work. My hypothesis is that on a per capita basis, we're delivering less value than we have in the past and our ability to have impact is declining. So I see that in some ways in the depth of the work that we do and frankly, in the quality of the solutions that get delivered. Look, if we were creating great problems, as you said, if they passed the lead test, if they were easy, well, the work would be getting done somewhere else wouldn't matter. The, the ultimate goal is that we're delivering value to customers. But I think that that is um, it's not as strong as it used to be. And I think there's a, there's a lot of potential reasons for that. Uh, but I think that's that's what I'm seeing. OK, Debbie, from your perspective. Totally agree. And I also could rattle off the monster list of reasons of how we got here and how we stay here. But I would say that if we're just looking to define what the decline of UX could mean, it would, to me, it in addition to what Jeremy said, it also has to do with hiring the wrong people for the jobs or giving the tasks to whoever at the company is curious about UX or feels passionate about UX or has empathy, which, which goes with this. I've got empathy. So... I'll do the UX work. Um, and so I think that um, the, the UX, ha UX has declined mostly because as it, at, at its core, it's misunderstood. People think that it's just artsy, um, that it's just, they, they saw the word design, so they think we're all artsy fartsy hipsters. And that misunderstanding is kind of a hub and spoke problem that now has 
kind of just bled out to all kinds of other problems, the, the hiring, the processes, the, the quality for the customers. I totally agree with Jeremy that if most of us think about the apps and websites and systems that we use every day, we hate almost all of them. And the quality of our products is not going up. That's why my big presentation at Agile and Engineering Events this year is called Improving Agility by Using Customers' Definitions of Done and Quality. Because they're not now. There you go. I knew about, ten, well, not even 10 years ago, maybe it was about six years ago when I sat in a professional services association meeting where there were over 200 people from um, consulting firms, you know, the big, the top five, right? And, and then some all around the government. And the head of this association said that um, the GSA has a team inside of it that's, that was initiated by some superior UX talent. And this person who was the head of the professional services association said that all they were was web designers. And yet they were doing heavy lifting on the research, the testing, the innovation and improving government products every day of the week. They were making them really easy. They still got work to do. But at that point, I saw the flip. I saw what was happening. And and so if we see this happening and people at the highest levels are communicating this down, how do we stop that bleeding? How do we not move UX into the web design? I, and there's nothing wrong with web design. There really isn't. But there's something that comes before the actual design. And to me, that's the research and the testing. How do we stop this bleeding? And we'll start with Debbie. Yeah, thanks. Um, what I've been saying for a while is that the number one way to fix the decline of UX or UX being misunderstood or whatever you want to call it, to me, the number one fix is accountability. If someone at our companies were holding UX accountable, because I've never been held accountable at any job I've had. Nobody said, you know what, this didn't work out so well for the customer. Let's go talk to Debbie to see what happened here. It was always, mm, this went a little funky. Let's talk to the product manager or engineering. So I believe that if we were truly held accountable, you'd have to hire better people to do our jobs. You'd have to check if their work is good. You would have to check if they're being given the time, budget, and resources to do good work. You would have to see that we're going beyond engineering standards for quality. If we were being held accountable, boot camps wouldn't be able to spit out people who learned for a handful of weeks and tell them you're job ready. Because if boot camps knew that we were going to be held accountable at our jobs, they would have to prepare people better. They can only get away with ill prepare pairing of people now because they know no one's going to hold us accountable. And in fact, at many companies, not all, but I have often seen when they hire a not great UX person who does not great work, the company actually lowers their opinion of UX. Instead of saying, oh, you know what, Pat is not the best at this. We should probably look for someone else. Somebody goes, I guess UX wasn't that important. And, and so ultimately, I think the, the solution moves towards accountability and more of us uh, speaking up because a lot of us didn't love design sprints. A lot of us didn't love the Lean UX book. A lot of us didn't love some of what Agile was shooting for. And we said nothing because we wanted to be liked and we wanted to be included. And we hoped that people would talk about design and sit with us at the lunch table and play with us at recess. And we didn't speak up. And now all this crazy crap is out of control. We don't control any of this anymore. And we don't have a say in it. That's a short version. Over to Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy. <laughs> so I, would, I have a different take on accountability, but before we get to that, I think it's important to talk about what are teams measuring and what, are, what would we be accountable for? And measuring the outcome is hard. Did we have impact? So because that's hard, it reverts back to measuring output. Did we deliver something? And if we delivered something, we call that a win. And we don't often look back at whether or not it changed, had any impact on the customer or the, the important business metrics. So if we're only looking at output, we're missing really the value of UX is, yes, we can accelerate output, but really we're trying to change the impact. So that's the harder thing to measure. Now, when it, I think when it comes to accountability, I, I see sometimes a, the, the discipline accountability can move into an extreme. 
And when each part of the team is accountable for just their piece of it, it starts to lead to siloed um, organizations where, okay, I'm, I'm the engineering and I'm, you tell me exactly what to do and I'm going to, I'm accountable for that. I will do that. UX, well, product, tell me exactly what you need and I will do that. I prefer to see an organization where they say, here's the outcome we're trying to achieve. The team as a whole is responsible for, for achieving that outcome. I mean, I, I, I joke that no, no user has ever said, well, this product sucks, but I heard the wireframes were great. <laughs> it's, it's not enough that design does great work. It all has to come together to create a great product. And we have an important role to play, but I think for, for my money, and I, I agree everything that Debbie said in terms of there's a lack of understanding in terms of the, the potential impact that UX can have in organizations. I think the part that we play in that beyond the education piece is tying it to tying it directly to the top goals of the organization. Why do you think that is, Jeremy? And, I, and this to me is like nails on a chalkboard. Because I will tell you, and Debbie knows this because she took the class, if I can't get a decent story that ties back to business in, business outcomes, which includes customer satisfaction, user, you know, usability, you know, all those things tie back to profit, brand, and efficiencies, right? So why is it that the user experience folks are struggling with this piece? Well, I don't it think could it's, be the it's same taught. reason because designers do too. Yeah, I don't think it's taught. We, we teach people how to do the craft but not how to connect with stakeholders and speak someone else's language. We speak our language and we rarely speak the other disciplines language. Like I think a simple analogy would be if, if you met your local high school football coach and they said, well, I want to get my team prepared to win the state championships. And you said, great, I'm a dance instructor. Let's go. They'd say, well, no, no, I want to prepare my football team to wear the state <laughs> champion. No, I'm a dance instructor. Let's go. It's going to go nowhere, but you say, hey, well, how important is footwork and agility and being nimble to your team's ability to win? Oh, that's extremely important. Great. Well, I have a program where we use dance to cross train athletes for, for better footwork. Now you've connected what you do to the value, to the need that someone else has. And just as we do that for our external customers, we have to do the same thing with our internal customers. Same and what question, I wanted David. to add to that, well, I, I wanted to add to that, that I see a lot of stuff go by in LinkedIn that says things like, um, I keep hearing that UX doesn't speak the business's language, so I'm going to do more UX evangelism. And, and, and I say, well, then actually you, you're part of the problem. Like when, when someone says you're not speaking my language, the answer to that isn't, well, step into my world and hear more of my language. The answer to that is questions. Okay. You say, I'm not speaking your language. Tell me more about what I'm missing or tell me more about what your strategies, goals, and initiatives are so that I can make sure that while I am customer centric, I'm also focused on the things you need. Tell me about how when I do work, how can I deliver it so that it makes sense to you? Maybe some of my reports are too long or wordy for you. How can I deliver my stuff so that it makes sense to you? So when I keep hearing, I'm going to invite them to design thinking workshops and I'm going to evangelize to them and hold more meetings about how great UX is, you know, congratulations, you're proving this person's point. You're I completely agree. That you're proving that you do not speak that language and you're not even listening. You are being a high ego, not action, not hero. You, you, are, you are just looking in that mirror and going, I am great and I'm going to keep, keep telling this guy about that. It's kind of like the ugly American tourist who goes to another country and just speaks English loudly at someone. <laughs> 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 I just say it louder, maybe on the family. Yeah. That happens. Yes, I know that happens. So let's talk about, let's go into that just a little bit further, if you don't mind. So how, at what, so a lot of what you're saying is stuck in leadership. So the person who is in the leadership role for UX within that organization has a big responsibility. And so if you are taking on that leadership role in a, in a user experience capacity and you are getting pushback, so the senior, the, the product manager, the business line VP is saying, this has to be done in X period of time. We don't have time to do this, that, and the other. How are you as the UX leader going to understand, how are you going to meet their business expectations while not delivering something that is crap? 
How do you do that, Jeremy? Look, I, there's always going to be constraints on delivery. And I think, you know, going back as long as I've been doing this and even, you know, before, before we were in an iterative world and we had our, you know, dis discover, define, design, we had all our phases, you never actually did a project that, that did all those things. There's always compromise you're going to make. So the question is, if you take into account the goal that you're trying to achieve and the constraints that you have, the real constraints, and then the, what are the fuzzy constraints that might be self-imposed? How do you craft a process that's going to have the best chance of getting you to that outcome, right? You're going to be limited lots of different ways. So, you know, I, if it's not going to be perfect, how do you make it as good as possible? And then what are the risks associated with that? And are those risks acceptable? And if those risks are acceptable, okay, move forward. Can you, if you can mitigate those risks, great. If those risks are not acceptable, something's going to have to change. Right. Debbie, what do you think totally about that? Totally agree. Yeah, I, I talk all the time about the risks uh, that companies face and how great CX and UX can predict and mitigate those risks and, and why we need to do more of that. But what I wanted to add to Lee's original question was what I call the leftover crumbs of time. And what I find is that when many projects are being planned, the project manager, the program manager, whoever is doing this at, at the company or, or for that team will go to engineering and say, how long do you think you need for this? And hey, product, how long do you think you need for this? And hey, mar marketing, how much lead time do you need? And nobody goes to UX and says, how much time do you think you need for this? Here's the project we're working on. And so what happens is UX gets the leftover crumbs of time. And we're typically told that engineering is going to get months and product's going to get this and marketing needs this and UX, you know, you've got two days. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been called into at Fortune 100, 200 companies where I was being told about a project for the very first time and I was told, get us final wireframes in two days. And my response was, do you know what, you, what I do? And do you know the way that I can do it well? And the answer was no. So I remind companies that one way is to bring UX into the early phases of project planning and feature scoping or epic planning or whatever it happens to be at your company, because who knows whether you're waterfally or agile or somewhere in the middle, um, whatever it is, include UX in that earliest planning so that if someone says, you know, I should really do three weeks of research and then I'll probably need another three, four weeks to go through some concepts, concept testing, iteration, you know, get, can you give me two months for this that someone doesn't go, oh my God, you know, we should be planning for this. If we know what's coming, Q3, Q4, Q1 next year, give me my freaking two months. Like give me, give me a month, give me something other than the leftover crumbs of time. Jeremy. Yeah. That's very interesting. Jeremy, I want to take this to, to uh, uh, another question here. So we agree that leadership in the UX within the organization is really the critical factor here because that person will set the tone. What happens when you've got, and, and this is happening every day of the week when I talk to candidates and I ask them how were they coached and managed and they pretty much weren't. It was really all about production and and you know, getting out wires and and flows and all right. It's just that vicious cycle. So we've this is a huge issue. If our industry is filled with leaders who are not promote who are promoting that leftover crumb of time, those crumbs of time kind of things. How, how do we? What are candidates supposed to do? What are new people coming into this process? supposed to do. They need the job. They've got to build their portfolio. What what do we tell them? Well that there's there's so many levels to unpack there. I part of it from that from that leadership level is that leader is responding to something in the organization that is encouraging them to behave in that way. One assumes that that's not their ideal. They're trying to do better, but that's how they're responding. Mm -hmm. From that perspective, Again, as, as I've grown practices in other organizations, when the organization doesn't understand the value, there's usually something, some need that they have and that's why they're bringing in UX. So the first thing is deliver on that and earn trust and then find a way to carve out time to demonstrate value of the next higher order impact that UX can have. And then people go, oh, I didn't realize you could do that. Great, let's do more of that. 
and then you you grow your ability to have impact. You use that. So it's sort of it's a it's an evolutionary approach. And I think the same thing can happen as an individual contributor. You may be asked to be able to do a certain thing, but how do you car sort of carve out some time to do a, something of value for the, that you believe the organization needs that they haven't seen yet? And if you can do that and show that value, you'll get not only permission to do more of it, but you'll get a lot a lot of ask. You'll be asked you'll, to do more of it, and that and again that then grows your influence within the organization. So get some quick wins. See 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 where the low hanging fruit is to get some quick wins and prove the impact that the practice has. Um, Debbie, I'm going to ask you this question. So we've got there, there are, how, how do we get the UX community at a leadership level to come together and say, this is, these are the best practices. This, this is really what we should be aiming to do. How do we get that conversation started? Yeah, that's a hard one because I generally am finding a couple of different camps in leadership. I mean, first of all, you have leadership who probably shouldn't be leadership. We have people who have failed up. We have people who've been given manager, director, leader titles a little bit too early in their careers. And, and we're going to suffer because of that. We're going to suffer because of someone who didn't really work their way up through uh, six or so years as a practitioner before being some sort of manager or leader. So th there's a a lot more happening there than just how do we get everybody together because the problem is not everybody wants to be together some of these people mm -hmm. have art school graphic design visual design backgrounds and they believe the best approach to ux is to keep making it uh, aesthetically pleasing and to focus more on the visuals and um, some of those people get ux and manage it well and some of those people do not and, and i've seen bizarre if you've heard any of my wacky talks then, then you know i i found job descriptions that required uh, a, uh, a UX researcher to also be an illustrator uh, because you're going to have spare time and you could draw some things for the marketing department. <laughs> so that to me is a problem in leadership. I can say HR put together a crappy job, but the hiring manager said, you know what? I need a UX researcher, but you know, I also need an illustrator. i put them all together. They're, they're all good at that. So I think that the, mm. All leaders are not the same. The Mies, the Jeremy's, the Darren Hoods, the Dr. Nick's, the Larry Marines, and some of the other people most of us admire. We're, you know, I think we're a little bit old school, old school purists uh, in the sense that we're looking for the practice to be done with science and technique. Not all the leaders out there are doing that. And as Jeremy pointed out, many of them are, are succumbing to the pressure from other parts of the organization and aren't standing up uh, for, for what they should be standing up for. They're, they're being quiet. I, we, we just covered this on my show where we looked at the, the, the tough dichotomy between wanting to be a people pleaser and wanting to make people happy and wanting to say yes at work to unreasonable time requests and unreasonable other requests. And the fact that we're there to be an advocate for customers, then we can't be an advocate for ourselves. There's a weird... There's some weird things ha happening there. Um, I don't have a total fix for it yet, but I am still hoping that we will uh, get more leaders who will stand up and speak out against the waste that should be cut in UX and um, fighting for qualified people to be hired rather than, wow, we need more researchers. Let's go get the DevOps people a research book and then have them do interviews. If I could add on to that. I yeah, think that, I was just going to say, Jeremy, that was a mouthful. Go for it. I think one of the things that, that Debbie hit on, which has been a big shift in the organization over, over my career, was this move from more specialists, even if you know people typically had multiple skills, to this sort of UX generalist. And while a lot of us aim to be the proverbial T-shaped person with a broad range of skills and a certain area of depth, if you're only having one person on, on a team or doing the work, even if they do have a pretty broad range of skills, they're only going to be deep in one area. In addition to that, by reducing things down to UX designer or you know whatever the title is, product designer, we have lost the vocabulary of information architecture, interaction design, user research, the things that help to indicate that there are different elements of the work that we do, what we do and they each contribute to creating an amazing experience. And when you sort of lump them together, 
I think they kind of get reduced to the to the, the lowest common denominator, which I think the lowest common denominator of what is understood generally is visual design. So when you when you bundle it all together, it kind of gets reduced to visual design plus some other things. And so I think again, that's in one way we've we've contributed to that lack of understanding by uh, essentially diluting uh, how we describe the work we do. Uh, yeah, if I can add to that, when yeah. I do talks at UX audiences, I tell people start showing all of your work that's fit to share with your cross-functional teammates. Not because you need their approval. No, no, that's not the right uh, dynamic there. But if they started to see your research planning, even small windows into it, your research recruiting, your research execution, some videos from your research, the research, a little bit of the research analysis, some of that research report, your information architecture work, some content strategy work, your medium fidelity wireframing and prototyping before it got pretty. We're not showing that to other people to get their approval because we don't need their approval. We're doing our own thing. And they didn't ask us for approval in what they're doing. We, we collaborate and we do our own thing. But people would see that we do so much more than sketch screens and make pretty, pretty boxes and buttons. And that would hopefully start shifting people. When I do these talks at engineering conferences and I walk through my little user-centered design graphic and I show people the types of phases of work that we do, whether or not you completely agree with this diagram, the bottom line is, hey, you know, I leave them with, hey, we do so much more than drawing boxes on a page. And, and not only that, this isn't just tactical, this is strategic. And usually after my talks, people are like, oh my God, we should be working more with UX. Or I hear uh, the UX person on my team is an artsy fartsy hipster. I hate talking to them. And I go, okay, well, maybe they weren't the best hire. We're not all like that. Yeah, I, then there's a whole need. So we are ha we have about four minutes left. Goes by fast, doesn't it? So I want to get into some tactical things that P that the UX community can do. Uh, from what I've been hearing, first and foremost is I'm hearing that leaders need to meet the client at their level of need, but then add something to that solution that shows them UX is more and can improve outcomes. So those small wins are really kind of important. Anything to add on to that particular piece? Yeah, really quickly, just because we started talking about that before we went live, as an agency, when people come to my agency and they want me to skimp on work and cut work and only do half the project and don't bother researching, I usually decline that because that's probably not someone who's going to appreciate what I do. But when I'm working at a job where I'm a contractor or I'm full time, I totally agree with Jeremy. You have to go for all the quick wins that you can. You cannot be too picky. You cannot take your ball and go home. You cannot act like what? no research i'm leaving you know you're going to have to you're going to have to start by doing what they want even if it feels a little order takery so that you can graduate to look what else we could do if that so i just wanted to say to me jeremy's right but then there's also this other side of my world where i, I have different standards and i go actually over here no that's actually a good point because that's your business and your reputation right? That's your portfolio and those outcomes, those business outcomes are important. Jeremy, you were going to say something? Yeah, especially I think when the practice is new, I will often tell people serve the team before you serve the customer. Mm -hmm. Because in order to move the team, you have to earn their trust. And if you're advocating for something that they don't believe in or they're not ready for, you're just going to create conflict. So whatever problem they think they have, figure out a way to help them solve it. Once you've earned that political capital, then you can figure out how to spend it and where you wanna kind of nudge that team into a positive direction. And through that, again, you'll start to understand what's really important to this organization. What do stakeholders respond to? And how am I likely to be successful in communicating and advocating for uh, UX in a way that's gonna serve this organization and serve the customers at the same time? Wow, that's very helpful, thank you. The second takeaway that I'm hearing is become part of the solution as soon as possible, meaning don't wait for those crumbs to be offered. Um, you know, uh, and to your point, Jeremy, uh, networking, and, and Debbie also said this, network within the organization to understand what various functions and roles do and explain to them what you do and how you do it, which I think is gonna be huge. And don't wait to be invited to the meetings. I hear so many UX people going, well, the engineers didn't invite me to the meeting. 
Ask the lead engineer to invite you to the meetings. When are the stand-ups? When are the showcases? When are these ceremonies? I am coming to them. I might be half listening, but I'm going to be there. So I, I'm telling people, stop being so freaking reactive. Get invited to these meetings. Be part of the team. It's another thing, like Jeremy said, you will build that capital fast when people see you and they can experience you and talk to you and hear your, your good ideas and inputs and see you helping them solve their problems quickly. You never want to be the bottleneck of the Agile team. Oh yeah. And which leads to the third part, again, stressing the importance of sharing what you do and how you do it and the potential impact that there can be. So again, we're talking about collaboration. We're talking about proving yourself. I also think it's that the UX community absolutely must learn more about how businesses achieve revenue, improve brand and improve uh, profitability and tying that to what we do. Um, and it all starts with creating great products that your customers love. It really, it's, it, it's, I'm oversimplifying it, but really that's what it boils down to. So Jeremy and Debbie, our 30 minutes is up. Know that I'm going to be inviting you back again because this conversation ain't over. Dance <laughs> remix. There Long you version. Go. And, but, and, and whoever's watching this, I highly recommend that you follow or connect with Debbie and Jeremy. They are exceptional at what they do. They stand up for all the right things uh, when it comes to the user experience and the user. So try making things easy and we'll all live in a much better world. Have a great day, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.